Applying for the COVID-19 Relief Fund can be done in a few simple steps. Go to the link in the description, www.socialsecurity.kn. This page contains important information regarding the fund. It also provides you with contact information in case you have any questions. You can now begin to fill out the form with your personal information. Enter your social security number, first name, middle name, surname, your date of birth, gender, occupation, home address, P.O. Box Number Email Address And Telephone Number You now need to input your employment history. This includes your current employer, date last employed, your last pay date, the period which you were employed for and your secondary employer, if applicable. Next, fill out the eligibility section. <music> Lastly, complete the banking information. This includes the account holder's name, the account number, the name of financial institution, and the type of account. Enter your name as the claimant signature. Click on Submit to send, and now you're good to go. touching the mask, clean hands with an alcohol-based hand rub or soap and water. Take the mask and inspect it for tears or holes. Orient which side is the top side where the metal strip is. Ensure the proper side of the mask faces outwards, the colored side. Place the mask to your face. Pinch the metal strip or stiff edge of the mask so it molds to the shape of your nose. Pull down the mask's bottom so it covers your mouth and your chin. After use, take off the mask. Remove the elastic loops from behind the ears while keeping the mask away from your face and clothes. To avoid touching potentially contaminated surfaces of the mask, discard the mask in a closed bin immediately after use. Many people's income has been severely reduced as a result of the pandemic. There are real concerns about taking care of self and family in this current financial climate. In order to help to manage the stress and anxiety related to financial concerns, focus on gathering information. What concessions being offered by banks and businesses could I rely on to help me? Prioritizing what bills must be paid first. Which ones could be deferred until a later time? Which ones could be negotiated? Brainstorming. What other activity could bring in an income at this time? Remember, financial concerns are very real and could lead to distress and worry if they are left unchecked. Finding a way to problem solve helps to reduce the stress and anxiety that come with financial woes. 
This message comes to you from the St. Kitts Mental Health Association. Extreme sadness and feelings of despair could be some of the things people are noticing in themselves during this unusual time. Pay specific attention to see if you have feelings of discouragement, hopelessness, irritability, difficulty concentrating, and disruptions in eating and sleeping habits. Pay attention to your emotions and talk to someone if they are feeling overwhelming. Focus on positive messages that you get from your environment. Listen to uplifting music, stories, or news items. Distract your thoughts by doing something like reading a book, doing a puzzle, coloring, or playing a game. Humor helps to lift moods. Watch a comedy or have a good laugh with friends. Remember your own strengths. What are some positive things that have helped you feel better in the past? Remember, if you have tried everything and overwhelming feelings of sadness still persist, reach out for professional help. This message comes to you from the St. Kitts Mental Health Association. is on. Good afternoon and welcome again to the National Emergency Operations Center COVID-19 Daily Briefing for the 11th of May, 2020. I am Les Roy Williams. Thank you very much for joining us today for this briefing, one day after Mother's Day. I hope all the mothers and the grandmothers and all those who serve as mothers had a wonderful day yesterday. Today, we are going to have a number of presentations for you from the e-government, the Accountant General, the Police, the Ministry of Health, and the National Emergency Operations Center. Without further ado, I would invite Mr. Levi Bradshaw the Accountant General in the Ministry of Finance to address us. Mr. Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr. Williams, and a pleasant good afternoon to the listening and viewing audience. The Accounting General Department, Ministry of Finance, continues to discharge its duties and responsibilities during this period of the global COVID-19 pandemic. And we are doing this in full compliance with the Finance Administration Act of 2007 and also the various statutory rules and orders issued by the government of St. Kitts and Nevis under the Emergency Powers Act CAP. 19.02. The Accounting General Department is listed among those departments and agencies of government which has fully developed a functional disaster management and recovery and business continuity plan. This plan is updated annually. The plan was developed primarily to mitigate risk associated with emergencies and disasters to which the department is most vulnerable. And these include natural hazards such as hurricanes and earthquakes, human and man-made hazards and disasters such as fire emergencies, and technical disasters such as cybercrime, recognizing that we manage the government financial management infrastructure. Although the emergency preparedness and response planning 
Although our emergency and preparedness and response planning did not factor in the possibility of the emergence of a global pandemic, I believe that COVID-19 has presented the Accountant General's Department with an excellent opportunity to test the veracity and resilience of our business plan. I would just want to recognize, since I'm in the National Emergency Management Agency, the Office of the NEOC, to recognize the contribution of the staff of Mr. Samuels, particularly Ms. Clarissa Langley, Clarissa Longley Stevens and um, Ms. Owika, Owika Petty. They would have assisted the Treasury and we are grateful for the assistance. As it relates to the Accountant General's Department COVID-19 response, I am pleased to report that the Accountant General's Department, as part of the Ministry of Finance, has been open to the public every business day since the onset of the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on our small island federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. Our office hours for the transacting of business with the public is 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Consistent with the protocols that have been established regarding social distancing, the Treasury Department is currently operating on a shift system whereby our staff report to work at the office on alternate days, on, alter on alternate business days. In addition, members of staff have been provided with the necessary tools and facilities for the conducting of work from their homes. The Accountant General Department has instituted all the guidelines and protocols issued by the government through its various agencies, including the Ministry of Health and the National Emergency Operations Center, NEOC. These measures include, but are not limited to, controlling the number of customers that appear in our customer service section, the active practice of social and physical distancing between the staff, among staff, and between the staff and customers, and among customers, both within and outside the Treasury. So we would have established the six feet parameters, and we only accommodate three persons, three customers, in the public section of the Treasury at any one time. We also instituted the mandatory wearing of masks by both staff and our customers. We have moved to install automatic hand sanitizing dispensers in the public section. This has been a feature within the office interior section of the Treasury for several years. We have always have hand, automatic hand sanitizing dispensing machine. To strengthen our systems, the Accountant General Department would have activated one of its call sites in line with the guidelines of, a, of the emergency management and preparedness systems and business continuity plan that we have in place. A call site is basically a site where we have a number of our hardware, backup checks and other bits of equipment in storage. If for whatever reason there's an, a disaster at the Treasury, we can still continue to execute our duties and conduct business. That's a coal site. Sometimes the equipment are sourced in boxes and so forth. However, as it relates to a hot site, a hot site is one that is almost operational. The computers are in place, everything is there ready to go. In addition to the one hot site that we had prior to COVID, we have since established an additional hot site. So in the event there's, God forbid, an outbreak of COVID at the department, we can continue to discharge our business and our duties to our customers. We also proceeded to provide remote access to designated officers to facilitate the performance of critical functions off-site, these including officers having to work from home. I am pleased to report that during the first week or two of our lockdown, staff from the Treasury Department were able to process salaries and wages doing all the functions from their home. And to me, that's a great achievement. Consistent with the travel guidelines of the government through the NEOC, we also instituted a measure whereby any staff who would have traveled overseas to an affected country recently 
would be requested to self-isolate, self -isolate, thereby preventing the spread of the possible spread of, of the virus. We also instituted the frequent cleaning and sanitization of doors, door handles, counters, and other frequency, high frequency touch areas. We placed posters throughout the Treasury Department to educate staff and customers on practices that would curb the spread of COVID-19. We utilize the technology that's available to us and use the monitors in the public section to display videos to heighten sensitization of COVID-19 related guidelines and protocols. We closely monitor and limit the number of persons that are present in the customer service area, as said previously, and we continue to monitor all advisories issued by the NEOC and the Ministry of Health. As it relates to our response and support of the Ministry of Health, the Accountant General Department received a request from the Ministry of Health to conduct an audit at the Joseph and Franz General Hospital during the COVID crisis of the audit basically was to audit personal protective equipment which were donated to the government of St. Kitts and Nevis. These PPE included isolation gowns and surgical masks which were donated by the Republic of China and Taiwan and guard gloves donated by the University of Medicine and Health Sciences. The PPEs, these are stored at the central medical stores at the JNF. The audit was conducted on the 20th of April, 2020. A team of five auditors from the Treasury would have conducted the audit and completed the report on that very same day. The objective was to verify the items donated to the JNF and to ensure that they're accurately recorded and accounted for, and to verify that the totals recorded were consistent with the inventory list provided by the manager of stores at the Joseph and France General Hospital. I'm pleased to report that the auditors conducted the, the count of the physical stock and verified the amounts that were consistent with the inventory provided. As it relates to grants and donations, on the recommendation of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank Board of Directors, the Monetary Council, it was on the 11th of March, approved grant funding in the sum of $500,000 each to each member of government of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. St. Kitts Nevis and the other member states would have each received $500,000. This was to help in the fight against the novel corona virus, COVID-19. Half of the grant was dispersed on the 13th of March, 2020, and this was dispersed directly to the government of St. Kitts and Nevis to purchase testing and other critical equipment to detect, contain, and manage COVID-19. The remainder, the remainder, the other $250,000 was dispersed just last week, a week before, on the 29th of April, 2020. And this will be utilized to procure equipment supplies such as ventilators and drugs through the Organization of Eastern Caribbean's Pharmaceutical Procurement Services. That for those funds were lodged to an account at the Central Bank, which is used primarily for paying monies on to, out to the OECS PPS. I am pleased to report also that a number of our citizens and residents and indeed businesses would have found it fit to assist the government in this particular endemic, pandemic. In this regard, the Accountant General has deposited into a, into a deposit account at the government's treasury an amount totaling $264,784, representing COVID-19 donations received by the Ministry of Health from a number of citizens, residents, and businesses. A, big, a quick breakdown of the funds received. General donations, $177,034. Donation towards testing kits. Some donors were specific. We received $30,000 in that regard. 
donation towards testing. Some donors felt it was important to assist those persons who may have been come infected and were unable to pay for the testing. And we received an amount of $52,500 in that regards. Other donors donated an amount of $5,250 for a grand total of $264,784 that comprised the, the COVID donations that was raised locally. As stated previously, the Accountant General Department continues to discharge its primary responsibilities and duties, including the maintenance of a reliable, of a reliable accounting system to ensure rational financial management. The timely and accurate payment of all obligations of the government of St. Kitts and Nevis. Business must continue. We also facilitate over the period the processing of government payroll in collaboration with the payroll unit of the Human Resource Management Department, Office of the Prime Minister, and the timely and accurate payment of remuneration and pension benefits to public servants, government auxiliary employees, and pensioners. Indeed, during the period of the lockdown, and when some, depart some regions would have been on alternate days, free to shop, we took the decision to pay wages to our weekly employees, the GAEs, on Thursday. So for the last six weeks, GAEs are paid on Thursdays, and we will continue that practice. The payment of benefits to beneficiaries under the Government Poverty Alleviation Program and COVID-19 relief are also facilitated by the Accountant General Department. In that regard, we are not responsible for the processing of the applications. Our job primarily is to disperse payments to persons who have been identified as eligible for such payments. The Accountant General Department feels strongly that it's important that we continue the development of the, in control, of the internal control systems, which are primarily aimed towards providing reliable information that supports the efficient and effective management of the resources of the government of St. Kitts and Nevis. We also feel strongly that the maintenance and management of the government treasury bills portfolio is key. Persons will recognize that during last week, I think it was the 5th of May, and this week, the 14th, are Treasury Bill days. Because of the closure of the post office during the first part of the COVID crisis, we took the decision not to post the allotment letters to our T bills holders. T bills holders are invited to come to the Treasury, bring along with you your copy of your last Treasury Bill certificate, and we will process your payment. Indeed, as a result of the global COVID-19 pandemic, the Accountant General Department, Ministry of Finance, has been forced to fast track a number of initiatives, which are geared primarily towards enhancing the level of efficiency of our payment system. This would include the use of direct deposits for the making of payments to all vendors, suppliers, treasury bill holders, utilizing the electronic funds transfer, what we call EFT platform, used by our primary banker, the Sinkiton Nevis Angry National Bank. This will eventually lead to a positive outcome where we intend to go to the checklist system. The goal is we should be able to lodge payments to vendors, other suppliers, direct to their bank accounts, reducing the need for personal direct contact with our staff and reducing opportunities for the spread of the disease. In addition, and consistent with the government trust towards establishing a digital economy, the Ministry of Finance has engaged the services of Deloitte to assist the government with the development of a high-level online payment strategy and vendor selection of an online payment platform. This will enable the government to deliver a comprehensive payment platform for citizens residents and businesses to transact business. The Accountant General Department has been charged by the Ministry of Finance to serve as convener and facilitator of this engagement. This platform is different to the one that we tend to, that I spoke to earlier, where we would want to pay our suppliers. We, can, we are already paying our pensioners 
our employees, both salaried and weekly, directly through the banking system. We want now to bring online our treasury bill holders. But this other platform relates primarily that we are working with Deloitte is to facilitate payments to government, whereby other departments, other revenue agencies, such as Customs, Water Department, JNF and others, can join the Inland Revenue Department as an agency that can facilitate transaction online. So you would have all learned that during the lockdown, we were able to still pay for our licenses of vehicles and driver's license online. We would want persons to be able to transact business as the customs using a particular platform. These are some of the initiatives that the government is keen on putting forward as we continue to cope with the challenges that are presented to us by COVID. I would like to take this opportunity to express my profound gratitude to my management team and staff at the, account at the Accountant General's Department. I would really want to thank them for their commitment, their diligence, dedication to their duties and responsibilities and for their service to our nation, especially during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. I've seen a new spirit among the staff. Persons are eager to assist. Persons are coming out to work. And I'm very, very pleased. So on behalf of a grateful nation, I would want to express my sincere thanks to the staff of the Accountant General's Department. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Bradshaw, for that sound presentation. I now invite Ms. Ophelia Blanchard, who is coordinator of e-government, to give us a presentation, Accelerating Digital Transformation, Go SKN, Resilient Leadership, Responding to COVID-19 and Beyond. Ms. Blanchard. Good afternoon, listening public, um, persons who are listening to ZIZ radio, TV, online media. I would just like to say that indeed it gives me great honor and privilege to be able to present um, this afternoon at the NEOC daily briefing. I must first say thank you very much to Mr. Abdiya Samuel who extended invitation for me to join the NEOC just about 42 days ago since the activation. And equally, I would like to thank the Honorable Vincent Byron, who is also the Minister for the Ministry of Justice, Legal Affairs, and Communications. Now, when we look at COVID-19, certainly this pandemic has brought very severe consequences um, to us as a nation, as well as to the global society on a whole. We have heard a lot of the negative impacts of COVID-19. We had a number of deaths reported worldwide, and uh, we are inspired by the recoveries that we are seeing worldwide and also within our federation. And uh, at the last count, I noted that there was one person who is still active in terms of the COVID case. And uh, I am reassured that soon we may be hearing that we have zero active cases. Now on the positive side, I must say that when it comes to technology, COVID-19 has certainly accelerated a digital transformation, and that is why I wish to title my presentation this afternoon as COVID-19 Accelerating Digital Transformation, Go SKN, that is Go St. Kitts and Nevis. Resilient leadership is required. Responding to COVID-19 and beyond. So permit me just to highlight some of the digital tools that have been utilized
by the NEOC and HEOC during the course of the COVID-19 pandemic over the past 42 days. Now, persons would have heard Dr. Laws referred to almost every day, covid19.gov.kn. And I'm pleased to say that through working with the HEOC, uh, Dr. Laws and her team at the Ministry of Health, as well as the team at the Department of Technology, we were able to develop and host and manage the covid19.gov.kn website. So there we see one example of the use of technology during this pandemic. On the website, you would also find sections relating to statistics. And constantly, we would hear about the need to flattening the curve and having a straight line. When we look at the statistics, the local cases, the graphs would show you the curve bending and flattening as we have now reduced the number of active cases. When it comes to collaboration and communication tools, we recognize that given that we cannot always be in the same place working as we did before COVID-19, we have to utilize the technology. We have to utilize collaborative tools such as Zoom uh, and uh, Microsoft Teams, for example. We've noted that it is not just the NEOC, the HEOC, or government have been utilizing such platforms. We have seen the use of such platforms by the churches, by businesses, by different entities where they may not have learned a lot about technology before, but now they are thrust into it. Mobile app development is another area of technology where we have seen <coughs> booming. We have seen Nevis launching a mobile app and equally saying kids too will be developing an app for quarantine as well in partnership with the Taiwan Embassy. Cloud computing, another emerging technology, we have also been utilizing for hosting as well. Graphic design technology, so you would have seen the, the daily situation report in graphic rendition. You would have seen maps of saying kids in 3D. So this is the use of technology that's been developed locally by local persons. And you see a demonstration of the talents that we have in technology. Data analytics. Data analytics is really driving decision making, not only for government, but also for businesses, as we would have seen when we have lockdown and partial lockdown sessions, where persons would have to go out and they would do shopping, etc. The supermarkets can actually track buying habits and restock accordingly. Geospatial data. Geospatial data or GIS mapping data is also utilized as well. Decisions being made about zoning, all those have been taken into consideration. 3D printing. Just to share with you that as part of the Department of Technology, we do have an innovation and training unit. And the innovation unit has been experimenting on the use of 3D printing for straps, bands that we can use for face mask, face shield, and to look at a more progressive approach in utilizing technology during this time. Robotics is also another area that we have been doing some research. So we are hoping that in the medium to long-term future, we can see the use of robotics even in the health industry and manufacturing locally where we can assist, especially if we have pandemics and outbreaks where we cannot risk the lives of our nurses and medical professionals, where we can now introduce technology through use of robotics. Just to put things into perspective, uh, just to note that the government of St. Kitts and Nevis has a digital transformation strategy. And Mr. Bratcher would have alluded to some of the areas, in particular the online 
payments gateway or platform. But I'll just take a few moments to guide you through some of the areas of this strategy that are relevant to us at this time and going forward. The need to strengthen the broadband infrastructure. As we note that internet connectivity is a critical resource right now. Without that internet connectivity, we would not be able to do work from home and even be able to render this broadcast to you live. And so we applaud the collaboration of the telecom companies within St. Kitts and Nevis. Flo, did you sell the cable? For coming on board and seeking to extend and build and strengthen our internet capacities throughout the different communities. Then we look at a multi-layered sustainable cybersecurity program. Now it is critical to note that during this time with COVID-19, everybody is connected online and also the hackers are connected online. And so it is also a great opportunity for them to, to use the time and their talent to be able to hack into personal systems. It is at this time that we are really calling upon the businesses and also the government departments to look to strengthen their cybersecurity programs to ensure that the systems that they deploy within their companies, their organizations are secured and consistently updated. Digital legal framework is so critical. Every time there is a need for us to draft regulations, it is important to be able to consider the implications and therefore the rapid development of the legal framework is important. Information and data management framework, everything is now based on data and information and guiding the way we move, the way we decide what to do and our decision making process. Digitization of government services. So we are seeing more and more of our government services being digitized. And on the next slide, I would share with you more detail of some of those areas. What we find emerging is an ecosystem of innovators, of entrepreneurs who are inspired during this time of crisis to be able to come up with creative solutions ready not just for the local market but also ready for export and so we are hoping to see that even though persons would have lost their jobs through the the current pandemic the downturn in the ministries of, of tourism and the tourism sector we are looking forward to have new areas a built out of our technology industry to be able to feed in to some of those areas and really in, instill in new skilling and upskilling of our persons in the Federation. E-commerce and online shopping. We would have seen a fast track of the e-commerce. We were planning to have e-commerce roll out within a year. I can see it roll out in three to six months. And even in some areas, it was done in two weeks. So we can see a progressive move of acceleration of digital transformation. As we highlight in the next slide, where we look at a breakout of the clients, channels, and government, we can see over time, the government will be building out more and more of its services online to be able to allow its citizens, businesses, and visitors to interact with government through social media, web portal, and through mobile. And as we see, we would have had the ITMS system through the Accountants General Department, where staff was able to ensure that salaries were being paid from where they were working, working at home. We can see that for education, Education now have their website and we are facilitating them as well, where they can communicate with the parents and the students as well. E-agriculture, we want to move forward via agriculture, farming, fishing, 
can go through the agriculture department and then have an online presence where persons can be able to purchase goods online. We have EIRD, Inland Revenue Services, uh, more or less 80 to 90 percent online. Vehicle registration, persons can do vehicle registration. And in the legal area, we can see e-litigation. E-litigation where court matters at the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court level can be heard and you can have the submission of the files done electronically. You have a crime management system being worked out through the police. E-laws, we now have our laws online. And coming on stream in the near future will be the digitization of the land registry. So we can see that government is indeed moving forward with a digital agenda and ensuring that we can function during these times. Now, as I move into my final set of slides, I just want to reiterate the importance of ensuring that cybersecurity is certainly the top priority along with COVID-19 because we note that as you go through, as more and more persons come online, as more persons transact online, there is a tendency that the focus may not be on the security but just providing the service. And we are concerned that if the necessary securities are not put in place, there are a number of risks. There are a number of risks where you could have failure of systems, where you could have access to sensitive information, and then we can lead to more economic loss, which we are trying to avoid. And so following that, we highlight the employment risk, there are infrastructure risk, there are business and operational risk, and also information security risk, which persons have to be mindful about. And as I go to my wrap up, I would like to highlight that when it comes to security and data protection, secure data and communications of all forms as attackers target people who are working from home. So for the businesses and even government, for those persons who are working remotely, ensure that even the network bandwidth is provided for persons to be able to have access to their networks, their private networks, the private networks of the systems so that they can facilitate online working. Staff training. Before companies and organizations engage in staff working from home, it is important to provide the necessary training that is required to ensure that they can support and continue to work effectively from home. Disaster recovery and business continuity plans are ever so critically important. And we ask that businesses look at their business continuity plan and update it from the lessons they have learned so far on COVID-19 and also preparedness for hurricane season. Cloud workload migration, it helps in terms of providing a redundancy and backup so that public and private sector can leverage cloud-based technologies for remote working and migration so that we could ensure that key systems that we are putting in place are not severely affected to limit continuity. And therefore, I wish to end by saying that resilience is important, resilient leadership. And as we look to respond to COVID-19 and we go through the process of recovery, let us look forward in ways we can continue to strive as a nation and build through prosperity. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Ms. Blanchard, for your PowerPoint presentation on e-government and how we can respond to the COVID-19 
and beyond. I now invite Superintendent Cromwell Henry, Divisional Commander for District A, to give us his report. Superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Williams. A pleasant good afternoon to those listening to this broadcast. Let me start today's report with the police activity in terms of arrests. Over the last 24 hours, there were two persons who were arrested for breach of the curfew, bringing the total number today to 128 of person, for persons committing offenses under the emergency regulations. The Federation recorded a 69% reduction in major crimes in week 19 of 2020 compared to the same period last year, and a 43% reduction for weeks 1 to 19, 2020, compared to the same period in 2019. We continue to remind residents and businesses to be vigilant and be always aware of your surroundings and those around you or who you are doing business with, especially now that persons are required to wear masks. Always find a way to identify and know who, are you are, who you are interacting with or doing business with early in the interaction. Have the person remove their mask temporarily to be captured on your surveillance system or request an ID which you hold until the end of the transaction, especially when you are dealing with high value goods or money. You may also want to prohibit the wearing of caps or hoodies and sunshades while persons are on your premises. Remember, your own security is your responsibility as well. Today is the first of five limited operation days this week. Limited operation days have been extended by two hours. It's now it's now extends from 5 a.m. to 8 p.m. for the next five days. The nightly curfew now begins at 8.01 p.m. and ends at 4.59 a.m. the following day. Businesses and enterprises are therefore required to close their operations so as to allow sufficient time for patrons and staff to get to their home before 8 p.m. We recommend a closing time of 6 p.m. for gas stations and larger supermarkets and 7 p.m. for the smaller shops. Motorists are cautioned against reckless driving in an attempt to beat the curfew. Remember, we have recorded quite a number of accidents, traffic accidents near to the curfew time and these accidents, we conclude, were the result of persons hurrying to get home before the curfew begins and disregard all traffic rules and end up being involved in accidents. We remind motorists to give yourself sufficient time to complete your business so that you could get home driving within the speed limit and complying with all the traffic rules so that you avoid accidents. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Henry. I now invite our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Hazel Laws, to give us the Ministry of Health report. Thank you, Mr. Williams, and a pleasant good afternoon to everyone. Uh, this afternoon, we are going to be using the PowerPoint format for the presentation of the Health Emergency Operating Center Situation Report. 
the coronavirus has infected just over 4 million persons and has killed almost 279,000 persons globally. And this is based on data coming out of the World Health Organization. The new coronavirus has caused many changes. Economic changes, we see an, a rise, a rapid rise in the loss of jobs. It has caused social changes. We are human beings, we are social beings. But just because of this microorganism, uh, we are forced into social isolation now. On the local scene, in St. Kitts and Nevis, to date, we have tested 332 persons. Of these, 15 have been confirmed positive and 312 results returned negative. As at today, we have five results pending. As I said before, we have 15 confirmed cases. We announced our first case in March, around the 25th of March, and our last case, mid-April. It's been 22 days now since we would have announced our last case. We have 11 confirmed cases, St. Kitts, four confirmed cases, Nevis. Now, as at today, May 11th, we have 56 persons uh, quarantined in a government assigned facility. We have one individual quarantined at home. We have one confirmed case remaining in isolation. And to date, we have 756 persons released from quarantine. Okay, so I need to explain quarantine and testing. Now, individuals who would have come into St. Kitts and Nevis recently, uh, for example, we had uh, employees of two organizations coming in uh, for work, and we would have had the, con the, the students repatriated from Jamaica. So now they entered quarantine. Now they had to, quarantine was compulsory. So you must undergo quarantine for a minimum of 14 days, for at least 14 days. I want to explain that these individuals, they are not tested immediately upon arrival in the Federation. They are not tested uh, upon entry into quarantine. They are tested on day 14 of quarantine. And they are released at the end of this period, uh, given two, um, two factors. One, they have to be symptom free, so they are evaluated, examined by the health team. Uh, once they are symptom free, and uh, once their COVID-19 RT-PCR test returns negative, then they will be released into the community. Now, let me just add, um, we do not test these individuals on day one of quarantine. Because if you enter quarantine on day one, if you are sampled and tested, and that result, that PCR test result comes back as negative, it doesn't mean that you are COVID free. So you can be COVID positive, enter into quarantine, you can have a PCR test done, and that result can be returned negative, yeah? It all comes down to when you would have picked up the virus. Now recovery. Uh, to date, we have 14 of the 15 cases recovered. 10 St. Kitts recovered, four in Nevis have recovered. We have one case recovering nicely. Again, the average duration uh, between diagnosis and recovery is approximately 30 days. All right, so we have been successful in containing the first wave of our COVID-19 infections, and we've achieved this uh, because of our comprehensive COVID-19 operational response.
Our national statistics can be found on these two websites, www.covid19.kn and on our St. Kitts Health Promotion Unit Facebook page. I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Laws. I now invite Mr. Abdias Samuel, Chair of the COVID-19 National Task Force and National Disaster Coordinator at NEMA to give us his report. Mr. Samuel. Uh, good afternoon, all, and thank you for tuning in to this 40-second briefing. I want to welcome Mr. Williams. We gave him a holiday yesterday, so we welcome him back today. So belated Mother's Day greeting to all of you who tuned in and all the mothers around the world. It's a delight to be back with you today again. The Compliance Task Force uh, would have visited a total of 53 businesses today as we continue our plight in ensuring that there is compliance by the business sector. If there is compliance by the business sector, then it will aid the fight against COVID-19. We continue to receive a number of requests for repatriation flights for non-nationals of St. Kitts and Nevis. Again, non-nationals of St. Kitts and Nevis. We have also received a number of uh, requests for nationals who are desirous of returning home. Let me just clear the air on something. I have been re receiving a, a lot of queries regarding the uh, post that has been placed on a particular Facebook page uh, that belongs to a uh, corporation. As I am advised by the Mitigation Council Chair, the Honorable Attorney General, the, the border, our borders remain closed. We have not been advised by cabinet or any other official uh, government source that our borders will be opened anytime soon. So I want, this, I want to make this abundantly clear to persons who are out there perpetrating that our borders will be open this time or that time. When such a time will come, you will be officially notified and informed via our official sources. So please take note of that. Nationals who are desirous of returning to the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis will have to go through a process. And this process includes that you will be going to a mandatory, compulsory, uh, let me say, compulsory quarantine for the minimum of 14 days. And these terms and conditions will be set by the, our health professionals and persons will have to be guided accordingly. Further to that, you will have to conform to a notice of quarantine and isolation which you must adhere to in order to be facilitated. Uh, it has been said here over and over that our nationals, our nationals would not be denied. However, it will be done under a control measure. Let's be realistic. We have done well in flattening the curve. We cannot allow anything to take us over the curve, then overwhelm our system, and the sacrifice that you, our citizens, have made over the past six weeks in terms of lockdowns, in terms of curfews, in terms of adjusting your culture, the way we do things, will be in vain. I don't think we want to jeopardize that at this time. So I am making an appeal to those persons who are attempting to uh, disrupt the good successes that we have had to please the cease and desist from doing so as the country, uh, as the country cannot uh, take such uh, impact. Um, so therefore, please follow the procedures. Please contact us so that you will be notified and informed of what you need to do in terms of uh, returning home if you are a national. Our borders remain close to non-nationals. 
We are, there are no commercial flights to St. Kitts and Nevis. I have received a number of calls again from airlines and other persons about commercial flights. Again, there are no commercial flights into St. Kitts and Nevis. If you need any further information, feel free to contact the Office of the Foreign Affairs, Ms. Kebas. Uh, you could also contact the Ministry of Transport and the Ministry of Tourism, and by extension, our Mitigation Council Minister, the Office of the Attorney General, for further information. I want to uh, acknowledge at this time Sandra McCoy of Sandra's Caribbean Quenchers, who donated some drinks to the NEOC, and also Dreamy Group for the beautiful bouquet of flowers that was enjoyed by my mother yesterday. Thank you so much for considering. I also want to take this opportunity as we see uh, non-nationals who were entrapped here due to the closure of our borders who are coming forward and acknowledging the work and the hospitality that has been extended to them during the pandemic in St. Kitts and Nevis by our citizens. And I read, your beautiful island has been threatened by a devastating virus, and yet you and your people have welcomed us and our yacht, Sea Topaz, into your friendly communities and kept us safe from the pandemic. Enclosed is a small contribution towards your effort to control the spread of COVID-19 on St. Kitts and Nevis. We hope it will or may brighten someone's day. We thank you and we will always hold you in our hearts. Richard and Anita, Citopaz at Port Zante, and they have contributed 500 EC dollars in cash. 500 EC dollars in cash. And to you, we say thank you. So today, again, I want to recognize the hard work of the persons and well, members of the NEOC, HEOC, our frontline workers and security forces, and by extension, you, the community. I think you have responded well. And in my discussions with my colleagues through uh, the CARICOM, Caribbean in particular, the OECS, I will promote St. Kitts and Nevis as being one of the most disciplined. Everybody faced challenge, but I think our population has been responded tremendously. So tap yourself on your shoulder, applaud yourself for you have been doing well yourself. And uh, according to the statistics that have been provided from, to me, and I want to commend our statistician, uh, of, sorry, our statistician and our help from customs and the statist statistics department for putting together these figures. And um, according to them, 85, the range from 85 to 90% up to 100% compliance is being uh, seen gradually increasing by the business sector. So thank you to the statistician for providing such data for us, which will drive uh, decision making and also inform, will al allow us to make informed decisions. During this week, we will be meeting with the religious leaders twice this week so that we can uh, develop the guidelines and protocols for resuming church. I want to go to church. I long for the day to go to church myself. Church is a critical element of our society. Uh, we hold them dear and close to our hearts as they are a critical partner in this response. And with that, we are hopeful that by the end of the week into the middle of next week, we will have a recommend, recommended set of rules and, and guidelines that we can, uh, we can take forward to the Attorney General so for consideration for our regulations going forward. So thank you very much to you for staying put with us. Yesterday we had an all-females cast presented, and um, I think they did a wonderful job, don't you? So, thank you again, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Samuel. We have now arrived at our question and answer segment. 
The first two questions are for the Medical Chief of Staff, Dr. Cameron Wilkinson. Dr. Wilkinson, we have heard you and the Chief Medical Officer speak about herd immunity before. Since no vaccine is immediately available, why can't we go for herd immunity so we can eventually open up our country and get on with our lives? And the second question, we heard in the past that children were doing well with COVID-19. I am now hearing of an inflammatory condition affecting children with COVID-19 and even a few deaths in New York. Can you enlighten me on this new development? Dr. Wilkinson. Thank you, Lesway. To the first question on herd immunity, herd immunity occurs when a significant portion of the population is immune to the disease. And this can only occur if one, uh, someone gets the disease and recover, or two, you are immunized or vaccinated against the disease. And let's use a hypothetical situation. If you have a population of 100 persons and you had 80% of them who were, or 80 of them who were immune, these 80 would protect the 20 who were not immune because if the disease came into the population and it was exposed to those 80 who could not get the disease, the virus will die and uh, the disease will not spread. And in that way, those 20 persons would be protected. But herd immunity is actually an epidemiological phenomenon that refers to vaccination, really, and not a disease itself. Because uh, if we are to get immunity through the disease, it means that we would allow the virus to spread rampantly through the country and see who recovers. Now, as it relates to COVID-19, for example, earlier reports were that for you to get to herd immunity, you need to have about 65% of the population exposed to the disease. But recent figures from the CDC is showing that you would need to have at least 85% of the population exposed to the disease. Now, some persons will say, yes, let the young ones be exposed, but you cannot pick and choose who will get the disease. And as it relates to the mortality associated with uh, COVID-19, it can be 4%. Some uh, countries is even higher. It could be less. And so we are saying in our population, if we are to allow, allow the disease to spread, we are saying that we will be willing to sacrifice between 2,000 to 4,000 or even 6,000 persons of our population. And if I were to ask you in your family, who would you give up, your mother, your sister, your grand? grandson, you would not want to give up any person at all. And so that is not a route that uh, one needs to go. So when we're speaking about herd immunity, we're actually speaking as it relates to a vaccination and not a disease like COVID-19 that has a significant mortality rate. And so the best way for us to proceed is what we've been doing in making sure that we continue to contain the disease, suppress the curve until we get a vaccine to protect our persons. Otherwise, the persons who would suffer most if we go the route of herd immunity would be the uh, persons who are older, persons with a pre-existing condition, and the persons who are not well off living in overcrowded conditions where the disease will spread. And that's not a route we need to go. Now, the second question as it relates to the inflammatory conditions occurring in children. Yes, we said earlier on that children generally do well. And recently, we've been hearing of this inflammatory syndrome that has been occurring in children. There have been reports from North America and even in the United States. And sometimes when you have uh, a few cases, uh, it's uh, so much in your face on the news that you think it is happening worldwide and in great numbers. But this uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children is actually still pretty rare. It's a disease that is similar to a disease that's called Kawasaki syndrome. And Kawasaki syndrome or disease is a disease that affects children below the age of five and it affects mainly the medium-sized blood vessels. It's an inflammatory condition affecting these vessels. And the way the children present, they present with fever, they might present with conjunctivitis, redness of the palms, red lips, cracked lips, 
And uh, those are the main symptoms associated with Kawasaki disease. Because it affects the small vessels, I mean the medium-sized vessels that affect the heart, these children also develop cardiac problems. They can develop aneurysms in the heart and they can even develop cardiac failure and death. And there have been a few children who recovered from COVID-19 who presented with these symptoms, also affecting other organs like the GI tract where they were having abdominal pain and diarrhea. Some even developed renal failure. But as I said, it is pretty rare and it's found in some children who tested positive for the COVID-19 uh, antibody. And what is thought is that some of these children who recovered from COVID or were just asymptomatic, they developed an inflammatory response to the antibodies presenting with this disease. But uh, the other thing is, although you heard about a few deaths in New York, it's actually a rare disease and uh, the mortality associated with it is also pretty low. And a lot of persons recover or some of them are just treated with supportive care or with medications like steroids and uh, immunoglobulin therapy. So it's nothing really for us to worry too much about. Uh, the lesson to be learned though, if you have a child who develops a high fever, develops a red rash, uh, redness of the lips, etc., then these persons need to come to the hospital to be evaluated. I think that answers it, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wilkinson. This question is from an SKN news line. There has been some talk about the 1,000 assistance package provided via Social Security, the Department of Labor. It is said that Social Security was not set up to provide assistance in the manner from their funds. Therefore, it is illegal. And a different source of funds need to be arranged. Can someone with the appropriate knowledge comment on this matter? Attorney General. Good afternoon to everybody, and um, good afternoon, Les Roy. I think you assume that the Attorney General has the appropriate knowledge for this question. Um, the government has embarked on certain safety nets at this very um, abnormal time in which we live, where many of our citizens, workers, who have had to be laid off, be given vacation time, not work, and have their um, wages and salaries cut, needed support. And there have been repeatedly from this podium members of the Labor Department, I think it was just on Saturday, that Dr. Dion Webb spoke to you. We've had people from the Social Security speak to you. And they have very clearly explained how these social safety nets work. Whether it is PAP, the Poverty Alleviation Program, where those in households making less than $500, $3,000, could get $500 support monthly. But there has been this stimulus package that allows you, through the Social Security, to get $1,000. It has been specially set aside by the Social Security and is one that has the support of the federal government. It is what is needed at this time to help our citizens who are in need. And the government, the federal government, stands behind this program, which we are proud to assist our citizens with as they have some hardship to cope with the COVID-19 virus. Thank you very much.
This question, thank you, Attorney General. This question is for Dr. Wilkinson. If we have to cough in the bent elbow, why are we still greeting with the elbow? Can't that lead to contamination? I'm trying not to smile. <laughs> now, the whole purpose, first of all, of uh, moving away from greeting with the hand is that because the respiratory droplets can get on your hand and you can uh, touch a surface, touch someone and spread it, then uh, uh, we thought that if you avoid the hand contact, we can significantly decrease the respiratory droplets. And so generally speaking, one doesn't go around touching surfaces with their elbow. Okay? And so by asking persons to greet with the outside of the elbow, uh, we thought that that was a significant way of you decreasing the chance of spreading the virus. Uh, yes, you're making a point that uh, if persons are coughing into their elbows and we are greeting with the elbow, there is a risk of transmission. But you're also forgetting that we ask that you wear a mask. And so you really should be uh, coughing and sneezing into your mask. And so hopefully if you're doing that, there would not be any significant contamination by the elbow. But one of the things you can opt to do also is just not to greet at all. And so if you choose not to greet by the elbow, then that is even uh, better because don't forget, one of the main things we speak about is social distancing, saying six feet from someone. And so if you try to stay six feet from everyone, you will not have to worry about greeting with the elbow at all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wilkinson. These two questions are for Dr. Laws. If there are five new tests and results pending and no new quarantines, why were there five tests? And the second one, your reference to tests being done on day 14 of quarantine obviously is a recent practice. As I note, the number of persons released from quarantine far exceeds the total number tested. Hence, it means many persons were released from quarantine at some point without being tested. Am I correct? Okay, so thank you, Mr. Williams, for that question. Uh, let me say that um, not everybody in quarantine are tested at the same time. Uh, and so remember, you, you enter quarantine at different times. Your duration is 14 days. And so at the end of the 14 days, you are tested. And thus, five persons were sampled. And so we are waiting uh, the, the results. Uh, the other question? speaks to okay not everybody who was in quarantine was tested uh, today uh, in my presentation I spoke to what's happening now this is current okay our borders were closed on March the 25th and this is what pertains now that our borders are closed anybody who is asked well first there isn't any incoming flights and so you have to request permission uh, to come in by a, a charter or by whatever means. And you have to be a national. 
all right? And so you enter and you go into automatic quarantine for 14 days and you are tested at the end of the 14 days. And yes, uh, the total number of 700 and something who were released from quarantine, this speaks to the period of quarantine which started way back in uh, February. And uh, they were quarantined then uh, based on coming into our ports. Our ports were still open. They were observed. Not everybody who was quarantined was tested. Yes? These last two questions, thank you, Dr. Laws, are for Ms. Blanchard. Why is Gmail used by so many civil servants? I am very concerned that Gmail account is used for confidential information and communication with government offices. I think it's not professional and would like to see a change. And the second one, when will we have health records digitalized? Each time I go to the hospital, I am expected to provide the same information over and over again. My date of birth does not change. So having all details in a digital data bank would be greatly appreciated. Ms. Blanchard. Good afternoon again, and thank you very much for those two questions. The first question as it relates to Gmail. Now, we at the Department of Technology have been encouraging every civil servant to be able to use a government email. We do understand that it is important that we have government information to be transacted over government network and government systems to ensure confidentiality of information and security. We are in a process of going through from department to department and being able to onboard persons as much as possible. So for those persons who are still using Gmail, I want to encourage you to contact the Department of Technology and seek to get a government email. As it relates to the digitization of health records, the Department of Technology will continue to work with the Ministry of Health to get that done. Um, there would have been some work done a few years ago in terms of digitization of the records in partnership with the government of uh, the Republic of China and Taiwan. However, that project is ongoing and uh, we will continue into another phase. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Miss, or Miss Blanchard. <laughs> that brings us to the end of the question and answer segment. Thank you very much for your questions, and I hope that they were adequately answered. Also, if there are any follow-ups, you can ask those follow-up questions at tomorrow's briefing. Thank you very much. We look forward to your questions each day. This briefing is not just about presentations, but it's important that we have that interaction with the public, the questioning public. Thank you very much, Ophelia Blanchard, the coordinator of e-government, for your presentation, your PowerPoint presentation. We are getting more and more into the technology and the presentations by PowerPoint and so on. This is very good. Mr. Levi Bradshaw, the Accountant General in the Ministry of Finance, thank you, sir, for your presentation. And it was very enlightening to learn all that the, your office is doing in terms of trying to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus. Superintendent Cromwell Henry, Divisional Commander for District A. And of course, he highlighted one thing in his presentation about people who are, instead they're just wearing something over their nose and their mouth, 
They are disguising themselves with only their eyes out. Only their eyes out. They're, they're, they're warding up their heads and so on. And it's very scary because then you don't know what they are up to. They're going to stores. They, 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 you know, it's, it's very, very scary. And it is not right to be doing that. And it's, it, it's people need to stop that. The presentation from our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Hazel Laws, we thank you very much. And for Mr. Samuel, who is the Chair of the COVID-19 National Task Force, thank you very much. Thank you also to Attorney General. We seem to call on you quite often to answer those questions where you, know, you have some sort of a legal challenge. And Minister of State with Responsibility for Health, the Honorable Wendy Phipps, who will give a presentation tomorrow on, I think it is International Nurses Day. She will present tomorrow. Thank you very much to our medical chief of staff, Dr. Cameron Wilkinson, who opened the batting today. He came very prepared. And also, we thank Mrs. Christmas Jacobs, who sits there and who does a very important work of providing sign language. That is the standard around the world. So we are up to standard with our press briefings. We also thank Mr. Samuel, who is the chair of the COVID-19 National Task Force. We thank Mr. Nigel Farrell and Vesta Southwell, who are a part of the COVID-19 Communications Task Force. We also thank ZIZ, Open Interactive, and all the media for being on board with us, collaborating with us, and getting the message out of how we can all work together to combat this COVID-19 pandemic, which is creating so much havoc around the world. We heard Dr. Law speak about the social, the economic, the geopolitical ramifications of this disease. Tomorrow we'll be back for another NEOC COVID-19 daily briefing. Until then, take good care. Continue to do all that you're supposed to do to mitigate the transmission of the disease. And we'll see you back tomorrow at 5 o'clock. I am Les Roy Williams. I am Officer Donnelly Liebert Shiverton. Do you want to travel and don't have private transportation? Here are some travel safety tips to keep yourself and the persons around you safe from the coronavirus. When venturing out in public, it is recommended that you wear a mask at all times. Sanitize your hands before and after entering public transportation. The bus operators are also encouraged to sanitize their buses after each trip. Remember, always practice good respiratory hygiene. That means refraining from touching your face with unwashed hands. Always practice physical distancing. To maintain physical distance, the government of St. Kitts and Nevis stipulates that only two passengers are allowed per walk. That is, one passenger on each end of the bus walk, while one passenger is allowed to sit up front with the driver. This means that only nine passengers are allowed in a passenger bus. Remember, stay safe, travel wisely, as we work together to flatten the curve.
Thank you again. Immune to the immune to the disease, and this can only occur if one, uh, someone gets the disease and recover, or two, you are immunized or vaccinated against the disease. And let's use a hypothetical situation: if you have a population of.